Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world at this moment. Welcome and thank you for joining us for this first episode of the eSports Signal series in 2022. My name is Julia Shamova. I am Senior Director of Content Strategies and a co-developer of the Signal series, working together with the team of my colleagues here at eSport, the leading professional society for health economics and outcomes research. And we are very excited about today's episode. This is an opening episode of the second year of the eSports Signal series that brings a great audience that consists of many from the community of eSport, but also a great number of newcomers to the HUR field. More than 1,000 registrants. That's a record. So it's absolutely fantastic to have so many of you joining us today. Welcome to everyone. Signal is a new kid on the block of eSport events. It is a new signature program that we launched last year with the purpose to explore topics, developments, ideas that we believe will shape healthcare decision-making over the next decade. We all know that pressure for change in healthcare is mounting, it's accelerating, and novel ideas from other fields of human inquiry and other sectors of economy are increasingly becoming an inexhaustible source for innovation in healthcare. This is what we set out to do with eSports Signal Series, to bring a broader understanding of innovation with the goal of putting these issues front and center for the HOR community to strengthen its strategic foresight and ability to learn across the disciplines and fields in order to continuously innovate in its own field of HUR. So today's signal turns its attention to the discipline of computer science, data science, and questions of causal inference. It's absolutely timely topic. Those of you who follow the HUR field probably noticed that AI, artificial intelligence, has entered the top 10 HOR trends for the first time this year. Those who haven't noticed, you're welcome to check the top 10 HOR trends list on the eSport website. Well, we know that there is a great need to be very well prepared to use effectively these modern computing tools, but there is also a deep need to still understand the foundation on which the capabilities of these tools rest. So we'll dive into these issues today. Uh, a few housekeeping rules before we start. First, the, the episode is being recorded and all attendees have been joined to this episode in listen-only mode. We encourage you to submit questions by using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And the presenters will answer as many questions as possible throughout the episode. The host will screen the questions and if there are very many, he will be bundling them and summarizing the questions and bringing them uh, into the episode. So now I would like to introduce our host for the episode, Professor Uwe Siebert. Uwe is well known in the eSport community. He served on the board of directors of eSport, has co-chaired the European eSport meeting and teaches several eSport short courses. His research interests include applying real world evidence-based quantitative, causal and translational methods in public health and medicine in the framework of medical decision-making clinical guideline development, regulatory decision-making, health technology assessment, as well as patient guidance. His research focuses on cancer, infectious disease, cardiovascular disease, neurological disorders, and others. Professor Siebert received his medical degree and his Master of Public Health from the Ludwig Maximilians University Munich, and his Master of Science in Epidemiology and doctoral degree with a concentration in decision sciences from the Harvard School of Public Health. Uwe is also a passionate teacher of causal inference at eSport, UMID, Harvard, and many other places. Uwe, we look forward to the conversation. Over to you. So welcome all participants and thank you very much, Julia, uh, for handing over to me. Um, 
It is a huge honor, and I thank ISPO for having me invited to host this session. Welcome everybody to the Signal episode titled The New Science of Cause and Effect, Causal Revolution Applied. It's my huge pleasure and honor to welcome Judea Pearl, Professor Judea Pearl at our ISPA Signal episode. Judea Pearl is Chancellor Professor of Computer Science and Statistics at the University of California, Los Angeles, where he directs the Cognitive Systems Laboratory and conducts research in artificial intelligence, human cognition, and philosophy of science. He has been described as a pioneer and giant in multiple fields. He was one of the pioneers of Bayesian networks, particularly in the probabilistic approach to artificial intelligence. So linking um, this science to empirical data. And he was actually one of the first using mathematics to formalize causal modeling and empirical sciences. His work has revolutionized causal reasoning in many different disciplines, including AI, statistics, data science, epidemiology, medicine and public health, social science, psych psychology, econometrics, economics, and many more to list. And the list of these disciplines is actually growing. Professor Pearl has authored and co-authored numerous pivotal research papers and five books, one of which, Causality, and published in 2000, was one of the most important textbooks for many of empirical scientists, including us epidemiologists and health scientists. And with the book of Why, the last of his books, published in 2018, he brings the way of thinking and let's call it the wisdom of causal reasoning to a general audience. Professor Pearl is a member of several renowned societies, such as the National Academy of, Soci of Sciences, the National Academy of Engineering, the Cognitive Science Society, the Royal Statistics Society, the Association of the Advancements of Artificial Intelligence, and many others. If you go, to, if you go through Judea's uh, CV, you will find more than 40 awards and honors, way too many to mention them here. He got his first award in 1965, and in the new millennium, there is nearly no year without an award. Uh, let me just highlight two awards. In 2012, he received the Technion's Harvey Prize and the ACM Turing Award. Uh, the latter is also referred to as the Nobel Prize in Computing. But the list of awards goes on until today. Judea. As you know, the first time I met you was in 1999. I didn't meet you personally, but through the paper causal diagrams for epidemiologic research, written by Greenland, Pearl, and Robbins. And at that time, I took the Harvard course, Epidemiology 247A, where students had to summarize kind of very old methodological milestone papers of, of EPI, uh, of all these famous authors. And that year, the course director, Murray Middleman, came in and said that this year there is a new paper and that made it into his list of milestones papers. I immediately grabbed that paper, digested it, presented it to the class. And since then I have never let go the causal arrows and diagrams. So my personal thanks to you for having shaped my scientific life. I'm looking very much forward to your talk and to our conversation afterwards. Judea, the floor is yours. Share my screen. It will take a minute, but I'll be there. Is my slide on? Everybody see the hello, everybody. Perfect. I'm glad, I'm Everything glad, is set. <laughs> I'm glad to be here, and the uh, first time of my in my life that I'm talking with real trialist. I always have trialists in my mind, but I never met one. And uh, this is my chance to say something useful for people who make things useful. So the recurring theme in my talk here is to answer the question, what can causal science tell healthcare decision-making? And the interplay between a science and experiment will be the topic of my talk. 
um, ex of course, science is made of experiments. Experiments are not excluded from science, but experiments without a theory is a very hard thing. It's a bit incomplete. Um, let's see, if you look at history, I don't think that Eddington will travel to the South Hemisphere to conduct his experiment if it wasn't for Einstein theory of general relativity. And I don't believe Michelson and Morley would have conducted their experiment if it wasn't for the theory of Lorentz contraction and so on. I would even go to Eratosthenes and I say that Eratosthenes would not have measured the radius of the earth if it wasn't for the stupid theory that we are all on a, a shell of a turtle and a turtle has a radius. So I will be spending time on this interplay between these two entity theory or science and then experiments. I first have to define what I mean by scientific paradigm. So I will talk within this uh, segment on the two fundamental laws of causal inference. They, I call them fundamentals because once you acquire them, you don't need to listen to lectures. You can derive everything by pure mathematics. Then I'll talk about the ladder of causation which gives you a nice panoramic overview of what you can do and what you cannot do in every um, type of, when in, in possession of any type of knowledge or data. And then I'll talk about the do calculus that will be the algebra of, sorry, it should be interventions here, not inventions. Um, since I'm talking to trialists, and trialists are masters of intervention. I think it's a very important for interventionists to have a calculus in the same way that astronomers have a calculus of equations on algebra. Um, interventionists should have a algebra of interventions. I will then go to the sum to the question, which is the main topic of today's talk what the science can add to trialists now. And the main thing is, will be the combining combination of trials with knowledge and with observational studies. And I should have added here another component, which is um, uh, combining trials with trials because even the most uh, pure trialist, one who object to the introduction of any uh, knowledge outside the data would have to admit that um, some knowledge must be resorted to, some scientific knowledge, uh, when you come to combine re uh, experimental findings with each other. So the first topic will be then fusing data from multiple sources. Remember the word fusing. And specific within this general scheme of combining data from multiple sources, I'll pick on two um, particular and important uh, area of applications. One would be the recovery from selection bias, and the other will be personalized medicine. So here I'm set to start the conversation, and I need to start by telling you that even in computer science, which is normally associated with the machine learning, there is a tension between two paradigms. There is a paradigm, a scientific paradigm, which I'm going to define in a second, and the data-centric paradigm. So what do I mean by scientific paradigm? 
And here is a definition that I really like because I just wrote it yesterday when I prepared my slide. The question is, when you are engaged in a scientific paradigm, you constantly ask yourself, what should the world be like before I can answer my research questions? That implies that you have a world in your mind, that you have a representation of reality, which is something which is different than a data. And once you have a representation of reality, you have a research question. And the research question is posed, it's offered to reality, not to the data. The data is a tool to help you penetrate a reality or open up a window to reality and answer the research question. Believe me, from everything that you're gonna hear today, this sentence is the key to keep in mind. A world and a research questions offered, presented to the world, as opposed to data-centric paradigm, which goes like that. How best to fit the data so as to maximize success on the training set? Now, this must sound a little bit um, tailored to the um, machine learning community. And you might ask yourself, where do we come in as trialists? Well, the answer is that RCTs sit someplace in between. You're not relying only on passive observation as the people in machine learning do. We do have experiments and experiments lifts you in what you can do very much like the reinforcement learning for machine uh, intel for machine learning. Okay, I would like to take you now to where trial all began, and this is in um, 1924 and 1925 when R. A. Fisher was playing around with the fertilizers in Rothamsted in the experimental station. Okay? And look at the difference between theory and experiment right here. <clears throat> what Fisher did was something counterintuitive or counter to what he was asked to do. You know? The farmers that awaited for Fisher's advice were not interested at all with randomization with randomized experiments. They were interested in the counterfactual question. Here I have a fertilizer and I have to find whether I should use fertilizer one or fertilizer two to apply to my entire land. I have many lots and they vary in their drainage texture and soil fertility. And I want to ask a counterfactual question. What if I use fertilizer one? Then what if I lose, use fertilizer two? And I'm talking ceteris paribus, namely keeping everything else constant, unaltered. I would like to compare fertilizer to one, to fertilizer two, keeping all these factors constant. Please tell me which one is better which one will give me a higher yield? And Fisher said, I cannot answer this counterfactual question because it's out of science, essentially. I'm going to devise a trick. Instead of um, answer, what will be the case hypothetically if I apply fertilizer one or two, I'm going to uh, randomize First he did Latin square, and then he did a randomization. Namely, I'm going to listen to a random device. I think in his case was a card, a random card, headed in blood. And uh, the question is, did he really answer 
the research questions asked by the farmer. He didn't prove that it did, but he was very convincing. And what he, the way he convinced people is the following. You ask me this counterfactual question. I'm going to listen to my random card and um, I'm going to uh, do two things here. First, I'm going to use the random card to choose a fertilizer on some lots and, and by different outcome of the card, I'm going to choose the fertilizer on other lots and the, I'm going to intervene in the sense that I'm going to force that treatment um, regardless of what I see in the, in the qualities of the LUTs, okay? So I'm going to use two things. One will be the randomization and the other would be a totalitarian imposition of my will. I'm going to submit the fertilizer to the outcome of the random card by a I call it totalitarian imposition of will. And uh, that's very important because not many uh, trialists, uh, I mean, you know that, but when you ask a statistician, what is a randomized um, trial means? It says a randomization, but that randomization is only one part of the uh, game here. The other one is, intervention, physically intervening according to the outcome of the card, not, not doing things ran, randomly by analytical means, but by physical intervention. And that's very important to remember. So although Fisher did not prove that what he uh, proposed here um, correspond to the research question posed by the farmer, he was very convincing at the time. He could have proved it he had he used a name and notation, but he refused to do that out of uh, uh, personality clash with Neyman. <clears throat> but he was very convincing and everybody was excited about the new tricks of randomization, okay? Now I'm going to uh, continue with uh, uh, some of the science. And I'm going to go through some uh, slides uh, uh, full of equations. Please do not pay attention to the equations. I'm going to glance over and I'm going to just ask you to uh, sense the flavor of the algebra of the equation beneath. So here is what I call the um, <clears throat> uh, fundamental laws of causal inference. First is the law of counterfactual and intervention. I'll explain to, uh, later what it means, but what it uh, gives you is the comfort that if you have a good model, which is a collection of equations like we saw in the first original problem of the LATS, then you can <clears throat> compute all counterfactuals that you can think of. And it, 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 uh, it in the box here, it says if you want to compute, I, I'll go I'll explain it later. Just, just listen to the flavor. The next will be a law of conditional independence. With these two fundamental laws, everything that I say you can derive. <clears throat> So let's go and look at the first one. What it means is that <clears throat> if you want to compute the value of y, value of the outcome, okay? Had x been small x, x being a treatment, and by the way, I'm going to use the y as outcome and x as a treatment throughout the conversation here. All you have to do is to form a mutilated model of the collection of equations that you have started here originally. And what you see there at the outcome y is the counterfactual. Here's y sub x. Just remove the parents 
of the variable corresponding to the treatment and compute. Everybody knows how to compute equations. So that is a secret of counterfactual. It's a, I call it, it's the uh, uh, oracle for counterfactual. Every counterfactual you can construct, had Y been X and had X been uh, Z and condition on C and so on can be computed from once by this trick because you have a definition here. Okay, the next one uh, is that if you, uh, uh, now I'm gonna say it in words, in words, the sentence, Y would be small Y in situation U had X been small X denoted mathematically that way, it's a, defined as follows. This, it's a solution for Y in the mutilated set of equation M sub X with input U, U equal to U is equal to Y. The two sentences are the same. I, I call it fundamental equation of counterfactuals. There are many, many people that object to this fundamentality property, but I will insist and tell you that if you want to be coherent, logically coherent, you start here, not at potential outcome and not at uh, some other tricks there, but you start right there because you need to know where everything comes, comes from. Everything comes from the set of equations. Okay, next we are going to, you have to take my word that if you are, if you are a good mathematician and you look at the kind of uh, uh, um, mathematical entities that comes out of this fundamental equation, you find something very intriguing. Okay? You find what we call a ladder of causation in the sense that um, some qu queries that you ask the system have the properties that they require intervention. That you, they are equivalent to intervention. They can be answered by experiments. Okay? Exactly what Fisher did. The, can, the farmer asked him a counterfactual question and he said, I can answer it by doing an experiment. So some sentences have this beautiful quantity pr property that they can ans be answered by experiment by random by, uh, con randomized control trial and we call them do. So I said, what? what uh, would Y be if I do X, okay? And we designate them by the do operator, okay? Others have different quality. Some of them do not need an experiment. For instance, what is the um, expected value of X? I don't need an experiment. I can sit there with the hands behind my back and just count and I'll get you the expected value of X. Others, are more sophisticated than what you can answer with experiments. Those are we call counterfactual or level three, and they have to do with imagining, retrospection, understanding, and so forth. This is a super level of intelligence which is necessary for science, and that's why I um, I, I put Einstein over there. That's responsible for the technological explosion of the past, um, let's say, uh, 500 years. Uh, no, actually, it's 30,000 years. But um, okay, I'll give you an example of a question that cannot be answered by experiment. ETT, the effect of treatment on the treated. It's very important in uh, social science, in finding out whether um, uh, the recruitment proce procedure you use for your trial uh, has, is um, adequate. Perhaps those that came to this, uh, the study 
would get a good job regardless of the treatment. So the effect of treatment on the treated is a question that in generality cannot be answered by experiment alone. You need some theory to boost it, to, to elevate it to this level and answer it. So here you have a completely uh, complete hierarchy in the sense that you cannot answer a query in level I unless you have either the right kind of uh, data or the right kind of assumptions of the type I or higher. So you can answer question about statistics if you have experiments. You can ha answer question about experiments if you have uh, counterfactual assumption and so forth. Okay. That's pe some people tell me this is an eye opener. Once you get you understand the constraints imposed by the hierarchy, many many um, uh, hours of work can be saved. Uh, then the next fundamental law of counterfactual is reading independencies from the graph. Why? Because that connects you, the structure, the causal world with the data. So you need that. Here's an example of a an example of a model. Okay. Uh, here is the equations behind the graph. Use uh, randomized uh, random arrows that impinge on everyone. The functions are designated by the name of the variables whose value is being determined by the arguments here. And now, Whenever you have that kind of uh, structure, there is a theorem that says that, that it's a miracle. If the U's are independent here, the observed distribution in the data, right? Here it is, satisfies constraints that are independent of the function, of the form of the function independent on the probabilities and distributions of the arrows here. And they are readable from the graph. How? Whenever you have a missing link, you should expect a certain conditional independence to hold in the graph. Here's an example of a missing link. It tells you that C and W will be independent given their intercept, the separating set. There is a little twist here with the confounder. I'll skip that because I just wanted to get the flavor. S and R will be independent given C, no need to put W for a reason that I talked about. So that's how it goes. Every missing link imposes conditional independence on the data. Application, are enormous. First, model testing. Great. If you violate this conditional independence, throw away the model, replace it, something is wrong. Structure learn. You can think about the set of all models that are compatible with what you see in the data. You can talk about <clears throat> then intervention, you reduce interventional question to adjustment. I'll show you in a second how. And the fourth one is you can reduce interventional question to symbolic calculus with the help of this uh, trick. Okay. Here's an example known as um, adjustment um, or backdoor criterion. Okay. <clears throat> I want to find, here's my research question. I ask it not to the data. I ask it to reality. Dear reality, what is the probability of the outcome? Why, if I do a certain, uh, if I take a certain action, if I impose a certain treatment, and <clears throat> it, it is estimable, 
if I can emulate it, I can emulate this hypothetical question by analytical means, by adjusting for a certain kind of variables which satisfy a certain uh, uh, property. The properties is that they emulate the cutting off of the equation from X. Instead of cutting those off, I can play a game of imitation. Here is the imitation game. I adjust for these two variables. Namely, I observe them. I take them into account. I fix them by, uh, by uh, Bayesian conditioning analytically. Or I can take you this set. What the feature that qualifies them for adjustment is the fact that they, they cut off all backdoor between the treatment variable and the outcome. All backdoor means all those that have arrows impinging on X. Okay. Uh, here it is. Okay, here's the answer. It's an adjustment formula. We all know that. No, actually, trialists don't know that. Okay. So I don't believe in that because that depends on having a model. And trialists are trying as hard as they can to avoid, avoid a model. A model carries assumption, and assumptions carry subjectivity. We want to stick with the data according to what the, uh, who said that, Fisher? Um, <clears throat> according to what uh, certain purist demands. So perhaps uh, not every trialist knows about this uh, adjustment formula. It says, I can tell you what kind of variables can be adjusted for to take care of confounding. Here's an example taken from uh, sport medicine. When the research question is, does warm-up exercises increase or decrease the chances of inquiry, of uh, injury? Lots of variables around here. This model was put by an expert, by a physician, who thought about what possible factors could affect injury and in intermediate variables. And now the game is, can I, instead of conducting a trial about warm-up effect on injury, I can analytically adjust for a certain set. This, for instance, this set will qualify. Here it is, Z1 and Z2. This set, Z1 and Z3, will qualify, not this fellow, previous injury, because it is a confounder and it has some nasty properties. Uh, okay, so every time you give me a graph and you ask me, is it possible to adjust for some set of covariates to remove confounding, I can tell you whether it's possible by a very a simple algorithm, it's linear time with the size of the graph. And what about if you don't find it? Well, you can go beyond adjustment. Here's an example, like it's known as a front door formula. I want to find the effect of smoking on cancer, but I don't have any factors I can adjust for to satisfy the back door criterion, but Somebody told me that smoking doesn't cause cancer directly. It a, produces cancer via accumulation of tar in the lungs. So if I have observation on tar, I can do something different. Here's my query, and I want to go into, uh, I want to answer it using samples from the distribution, passive distribution of variables which are visible. S T and C, and this is my data, and I can do it. How? This way. Again, don't listen to the equation, just get the flavor. I start from here, I want to get what? My purpose is to remove the do 
the do operator because I don't have experiments. I want to do it, but passive observation. So I go through a sequence of step, chup, 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 chup. Don't do, listen to the equation, just listen to the flavor. And I succeeded in what I want to do. I have set of rules that I apply and I get an estimate. Why do I call it estimate? Because it has no do operator. It consists only of ordinary statistical conditional probabilities. I can estimate them one by one, multiply, take the sum. I send it to the department of machine learning. They can do it with neural nets very quickly. And I'm done with answering my query. And there is a, the, the algebra that takes you from step to step is given here. There are three rules that if you apply them sequently, you guarantee to find a way of answering your question if such exists and to get an answer, sorry, you don't have enough information if one does not exist. That's what we mean by completeness. Good. I finished the first part of my talk. How am I doing on time? Do I have at least 30 more minutes? Thank you. Yes, I'll take 30 more minutes. And um, next, I'm coming to the second part of the outline. What does science add to trialist? And let me start with combining trial with knowledge and observational studies, okay? So we will talk about the idea of fusing data from multiple sources. Here's a slide I'm taking from the book of why. Bing. The general problem is how to combine results of several experimental and observational studies, each conducted on a different population and under different set of conditions, so as to construct a valid estimate of effect size in yet a new population, unmeasured by any of those studies. It sounds horrible, right? It is horrible, but it's doable. So it looks like that. Here's an example. I want to find the causal effect <clears throat> of treatment on outcome in a place which I never visited, Arkansas. And there I have only survey data available. But I, there are, I know from the literature that there are studies made, experimental studies or survey studies done in New York, in Los Angeles, but they differ in the kind of population they uh, um, uh, conducted on. Here is a younger population, uh, and here is Boston. <clears throat> age was, everything was done nice, but the age was not recorded. It was conducted on mostly successful lawyers. San Francisco, <clears throat> unfortunately, we noticed that high blood pressure effect. Texas, mostly on Spanish speaking subject, high attrition, and so on and on. And I still want to answer the research question, which has to do with Arkansas. How can you put it all together? I'm sure that many of you, uh, not many of you, have faced this problem. And if you were facing these problems, you probably combine all these um, uh, experimental findings in your head or using meta-analysis, which is also something very funny, um, but it can be done analytically, which means you can put what you know about each study in a mathematical form, turn the the, the hand calculator and solve the problem the same way that you solve algebraic problem about pebbles and uh, people digging holes. How? Express what you know in a graph. 
This is the structure of the various studies. The S variables <clears throat> is a warning that this variable differ from that of Arkansas. Okay? There is there a source to suspect um, a difference in, in population. So every time you have an S with a square, it's a warning that they might, that W here might be related to X by different function than W related to X here. Here you have a missing link, which means you have conducted a experimental study, okay? These are of survey studies and you got to put it all together and come out with the answer. And the answer is feasible, which means there is a complete theory now, which lets you uh, answer this question, can be determined analytically, provided that commonalities and differences among the studies are encoded in selection diagram. This is the name that we gave to those diagram which have a square um, nodes in them. Okay. <clears throat> and when it's not feasible, whenever it's feasible, you can get a formula tells you what, what um, data, what chunks of data you can take from each of the experiment and how to combine it with that of others. And this can be derived in polynomial time. Most importantly, the algorithm is complete in the sense that if the, you don't have enough assumptions there, you know, if it cannot be done, then the algorithm will tell you, sorry, you don't have enough assumptions there. You, know? you better think of another experiment or, or another study that and, and sometimes the algorithm can be smart enough to tell you what you should um, observe in addition to the variables that have been observed. Perhaps they should have measured age in, uh, in uh, Houston. Okay, I finish what I wanna say about transportability. I know that it sounds, I went very quickly on them. The material is available in the literature. Okay, um, you can look at all the proof the point is just to listen to the uh, flavor of the analysis. You put down what you know in a formal way in a graph. If you don't know, it's fine. The answer, the algorithm will tell you, you don't have enough assumption. <clears throat> and you, you quit. You let the computer do the work. The answer will be some extremely useful in the sense that they tell you what part of every finding you should bring to bear and how to combine it with all the others. Let's now go to something which you probably are facing day by day. And this is how to overcome a selection bias. A selection bias comes whenever you're the <coughs> subject recruited for the studies are not representative of the population to which you want to apply the results, okay? Now, <clears throat> notice how I describe the problem using calculus. First, my query, if I don't have a query, I shouldn't even be paid. You have a query, put it down. You want to find the causal effect of treatment X on the outcome Y. Put it down. Next, what data is available to you? If you are in a selection bias inflicted study, then you have data only for those people who are selected. You have their variables, which tells you an indicator, this subject was selected. You only look at them. Therefore, you, you condition the results on being selected. This is the data available to you. But you don't want the result that you compute to have this selection though. You want, <clears throat> oh, you really want 
to have the S removed because you want the answer to be in that nature. Namely, there is no conditioning on S here. You want it to apply to the target population, which has no selection preference over there. So assuming that you also have data from some survey, no do operator theorem, the query can be recovered if after you submit this collection, this up, after you submit your query to the computer, the computer will be able to, or your hand calculator will be able to um, transform the query into a form, which is a combination of little, little sentences. All do expressions are conditioned on S. Why? Because you only have data on those selected. <clears throat> and all do free expression is conditioned, uh, uh, no do a free equation. Those which don't have any do is conditioned on S because you want to get, uh, if you don't have S, all you have is uh, um, data from survey, namely those which not have no do operator, no do they are uh, inf molested by selection bias, okay? So it's a very simple theorem, actually it's a definition. And here's an example. I have an example, here's the treatment, here's the outcome. I have intermediate variable Z, but I select samples according to some unknown function on the basis of Z. Perhaps people who excel in the exam, or perhaps people who suffer from extreme pain, those are registered, okay? <clears throat> oh, so here it is. Look at the three lines and I'll tell you, zoop, 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 two, two application of the do calculus. And what do I get as a result? I get an instruction. Thou shall take this conditional probability, P of Z given X from the survey. And once sh you should take this conditional, this experimental result from the trial, condition on Z, S is automatic because you only ran it on the selected units and you should combine it that way. It's a recipe for combining data from different sources. Okay. That, and that's of course only one example. Every graph you can give me might have a different um, tricks of overcoming selection bias, or you can get an answer, sorry, you don't have enough information here to overcome selection bias. Okay. This is a flavor of the, of the algebra of the Duke calculus. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm going now to personal medicine and let me just start by saying that this is the future of medicine. It is my strong belief and is based on counterfactual analysis, not on experiment alone, because <clears throat> it permits to us to take population data and estimate the probability that a given individual, you, would benefit or harm by a given treatment. And this should be contrasted and distinguished as opposed to what we normally find in the literature when people call, talk about personal medicine, they talk about the um, outcome or the causal effect in a subpopulation which resembles the individual. This is still a population property. No, we want individual properties. We want the probability of necessary insufficient, which is defined here, it's the probability of the individual causal effect being equal to one. Or another way, it's the probability that this individual, Mr. U, okay, would recover had he received treatment one and will be and will not recover or die 
if he or she gets the treatment zero, okay? Condition on this vector of properties or characteristics unique to Mr. U, okay? Which is different than, as you can see, from the average treatment effect written here. Um, to give you a sense that you cannot do it with experiment alone, just think of a simple case where the treatment uh, arm and the placebo arm show no difference. Okay, maybe 10% uh, recovery in each of the arms. Under this condition, you will say, hmm, a treatment is useless. And indeed, for a decision maker, for a population um, decision maker or policy maker, um, the societal effectiveness of the treatment is zero. The placebo gives you the same effect as treatment. However, ask yourself whether <clears throat> Which is the case? Is it the case that the treatment has no effect on every individual, or perhaps it cures 10% and kills another 10%? Okay, just think about it. First of all, we have to think about whether it matters. Okay. Well, it may not be, may not may not matter to a global decision maker who cares only about the rate of improvement in a certain population, but it matters to the patients who come on the operating table. Okay. It's very important to know whether you have, uh, whether the treatment will not affect you at all, or whether you have a 10% chance of dying because of the treatment. Okay. Now, this is exactly what we are going to assess, and it's possible to assess it if you have a combination of experimental and observational studies, okay? not by itself. Why would, okay. So in general, this quantity probability of necessary and sufficient, PNS, is not identified, not identified, but it can be bounded. And the bounded get improved if you combine experimental with observational data, may even become a point estimate in a cert under certain conditions. And <clears throat> let's ask ourselves why both experimental and observation studies are needed because what happens in observational studies that when people have a, a freedom to choose a treatment or not to choose a treatment, right? That kind of choice or preferences conveys important information about the person's history, the person, uh, company, environment, and even about the a person's chances of recovery. And that's hidden, but if you combine it with experiment, then you get something that each study in isolation cannot provide us. And I can demonstrate to you an example of a but for test for personal liability. I don't have slides for personalized medicine, but I have one for the um, in the legal context in terms of uh, uh, the but for test. Are you familiar with it? Here, here I have a very simple setup. <clears throat> Your Honor, my client, Mr. A, died because he used this drug. Okay. Now, the word because is needs to be defined, and the court of law have decided what under what condition um, a claimant like that can ask for compensation or on, on, under what condition um, the manufacturer is responsible for this case. 
for the harm or for the death that happened to Mr. A. Now, this is the language of the law. I didn't invent it. This is what the court of law says. Under what condition you assign responsibility? Here it is. The court decides if it is more probable than not the world of lawyers, not me, okay, that Mr. A would be alive but for the drug. Right? So this is a legal term, but for. Okay? You cannot express it in terms of uh, probability distribution. You cannot explain it even in terms of experimental studies, but you can express it in counterfactual terms. And we're done. What do I mean done? Once you express the research question in counterfactual, you are done because you can assign it to the algebra and the algebra is like a hand computer will give you the answer. Okay, let's see what we can do. If I want to do it with the probability, I'll get contradiction. Mr. A is dead. He took the drug, okay? What do you mean that he would be alive had he taken no drug, okay? If I write it here in the subscript, which is a counterfactual notation, I can express it nicely. I recognize it to be PN, probability of necessity, okay? And the law required that this probability should be greater than 50%, okay? I know that in general, I cannot identify it, so I can never reach 50%, but luckily with a certain combination of experiment and um, survey data, I can have a point estimate. And in this lucky case, the answer is guilty in, with probability one. Namely, the lower bound coincides with the upper bound, both are equal to one, uh, I wish the court will listen to that. Then I, <laughs> I am doubtful that we'll have such a unanimous decision by the jury based on uh, counterfactual reasoning. But it, it is doable. Okay? And I, I, in my book, you find the data that support this coincidence that the lower bound and the upper bound coincide both being equal to one. So you might be lucky. Under certain conditions, you will not be lucky. You'll have a vacuous uh, interval here. The, the PN will be between zero and one. You haven't done a thing. In most cases, you have a nice informative bound. Let's say between 60% and 70%. Since it is above 50%, guilty. And in many cases, it just gives you an advice of what needs to be done next. And here are some uh, examples, for instance, identifying or ranking patients in need. It's also the idea of need is a counterfactual term. <clears throat> patients are susceptible. You are, you are trying to find what set of patients are most susceptible to treatment in the positive sense, right? Probably the patient with characteristic C will improve if and only if treated. Namely, he or she will die if not treated. It makes him an extreme critical case and has a chance of being uh, cured if not. This is how PNS is expressed. And uh, again, experimental and observational studies provide informative bound on PNS. It demonstrates something which bugs the mind, that you can find property of individual behavior, Mr. U, okay, from population data. Both studies, experimental and observational, were done on different people, not on the one that I, is under the, uh, on the surgery table. You can do it with the use of counterfactual logic. I should also say no assumptions are needed here, okay? 
this is true uh, without making any um, non-confounding assumptions that you normally find in graphs. Okay? No, this is true for any um, any graph. All you need is to get access to survey data and combine it correctly with experimental data. And uh, so it's a marvel of uh, counterfactual logic. And uh, in my opinion, it will be the future of medicine, of personalized medicine. And its application goes beyond medicine. It goes, for instance, to identify customers worthy of recommendation or incentive. It goes into finding um, the voters which are, will be swayable by a slogan or by um, persuasion. Okay. Uh, the ramification for the political side is uh, scary, but we need to milk the science to understand the, how, what it can, how it can serve us most. And um, uh, I am now going into, yeah, it's in a, in a recent paper by Lee Miller and myself. It's available. And let me just, in case I skipped, there are other pillars of wisdom that I didn't cover here, mostly mediation analysis, uh, external validity, that another word of saying transportability, missing data, something which we thought is a statistical problem, turn out it's a causal problem and um, causal discovery, which I haven't covered here. It's a field which gaining momentum recently because of discovery of certain asymmetries that can be utilized to direct errors based on data. I will now reach my conclusion, and I always like to quote Gary King, because what he said <clears throat> absolves me from saying it, that more has been learned about causal inference in the last few decades than the sum total of everything that had been learned about it in all prior recorded history. If I were to say that, people will jump and say, ah, oh, you're self-serving. It is the absolute truth. And at least from a scientific viewpoint, we have today an algebra of causation, which we didn't have just a few decades ago. I should must add to it a warning sign that data science is a science of interpreting reality, not of summarizing data. And that should be kept in mind whenever we talked about the interplay between experiments, observation, and science. I think I have reached the end of my talk, and I should cannot finish without mentioning a beautiful quote by de Morgan. It's the same August de Morgan that was a contemporary of George Bull. He complained about formal logic that hasn't made any progress since the time of Aristotle. And he said, every science that has thriven has thriven upon its own symbols. Logic, he said, unfortunately, has not made any progress because we don't have symbols. And now he rejoiced the Boolean algebra. And I rejoice the availability of the algebra of intervention. And this is a joint work with all my students, co-principal investigators, reviewers, and uh, uh, editors which have rejected all the papers that should have, shouldn't have been rejected. Up, you, you can find them all in here in this uh, website. And you can also find a very lively discussion of these items on my Twitter account. Please join. And uh, I think we are talking now about 
um, the implications of to personalize medicine of the PNS bound. So you join at the right time. Ah, a time for a short commercial. This happened to be a very good book. I must confess. Yeah. Okay. Here I am. So thank you so much. Uh, Judea, thanks very much for, for this journey through causal principles, causal diagrams, and particularly thanks for bridging between counterfactual and causal diagrams and, and for showing the difference between correlation, prediction. Uh, you address biases such as confounding and selection bias, but you also address two very important aspects of our business in this audience here, which are selection bias and transportability and personalized medicine, which, which you mentioned you have a strong belief in uh, that the future is in this personalized medicine. It, you defined it actually as individualized medicine. So in, in, in these areas, um, you have once called yourself or, or epidemiology being your second family next to computer science. So a general question incorporating a few of the uh, uh, Q&A questions we had in the, in, in the uh, question list, is why and where do you think we need a causal revolution? We need the causal methods in epidemiology and health decision science. So, so why, where, and, and like in any revolution, could there be a misuse as well? Well, I never thought about the misuse, except for in few papers that complain about the, the tyranny of counterfactual in epidemiology. And people said, aren't we overdoing it? Shouldn't we go back to the happy days of intuitive epidemiology? Like the day of Bradford Hill, maybe even John Snow, you know, but we didn't have counterfactual, we didn't have, even uh, we didn't have algebra. We just, uh, uh, the sophisticated ones among us use probability and everybody was happy. These were the heydays that we should perhaps go back to. Now, I don't think this is a case because even the simple concept such as confounding was highly confounded and was never defined properly by epidemiology prior to 1980. 88, I believe, when Jamie Robbins in Greenland uh, <clears throat> defined confounding using uh, potential outcome. Okay. So uh, epidemiology was uh, a pseudoscience at that time. People talk and, about things they could not define and they could not agree on what confounding is. In my book of why I mentioned few epidemiologists, how they went astray and how they define confounding in what we today consider to be <laughs> simply wrong, full of counterexamples. And I, I don't know how to answer that question. Okay. Um, <clears throat> shouldn't physicists go back to the days before algebra? It, it was happy days, you know, before Vieta in 19, not in 19, in uh, 1597, I believe, <clears throat> came out with algebraic notation that you can have variable X and Y and, and combine them using algebraic uh, manipulation and get answer to toy questions. And then Galileo said, why nature speaks algebra? Now, it was a revolution because he could compute the strength of the beams with, and, and the period of a, of a pendulum analytically by sitting in his uh, table. Okay? It was a revolution and it revolutionized 
astronomy, evolutionary science at the time by simply having an algebra to do the manipulation that you would like have to, to do in your head and you couldn't. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, as a as a testimony, a, a, an epidemiologist who was still trained in the last uh, century, I, I completely agree. I mean, uh, there was a definition of confounding, uh, or actually of confounders, right? And then oh, only when when we had the open backdoor path and understood confounding and how to control for it, the picture became clear. I would have never been able to teach things like that without graphs. So. Thank you. There, there are a few. Well, you have proof that you cannot define confounding in the language of probability. Of probability, yeah. You cannot. And a century of epidemiologists try to do that. Yeah. I, I, I think I think we now got over it with with all the decks and the uh, and the concepts you have developed and have also introduced epidemiology. But the, the audience is, uh, is um, um, uh, sort of, you know, I hope that this spreads further beyond our, our borders. There are still a few very small, short technical questions in the um, Q&A. I tried to bundle them. So uh, one question, and that's maybe we have short questions and a, a, a short answer so we get through some. So one, one group of questions basically goes that in health sciences, the target trial approach gains popularity. So uh, as a, yeah, taking the research question and formulating a protocol uh, of a hypothetical randomized trial uh, with well-defined compared intervention. Uh, and the intention of that is to prevent against biases. What are your thoughts on, on the target trial approach in general, but also in health sciences? And one of the questions was actually, how does that help for personalized medicine? Do we need sample size calculation when we build a causal model? Um, so these are all linked questions about the target trial protocol. What did you call it, target trial Target approach? trial approach. Approach. So basically, before <clears throat> analyzing observational studies, writing a protocol of a hypothetical randomized clinical trial, which you will never perform, but which will guide you to avoid mistakes. Well, okay, so it's not really a scientific approach. It's sort of a, a, a help to the misguided. Yes, yes. Okay. So it's a sort of, a, a, <laughs> it came as a result of experience with a misguided epidemiologists. I, I simply, I don't understand for the past two, years, I have been asking on my Twitter account, can anybody explain to me what this uh, target uh, trial approach is? I'm still waiting for an answer because of becoming from my end, the research question is always posed to a model of reality, not to the target trial. You want to find a property of the model which represents reality. So we don't need to go to, uh, we don't need to imitate a technique called RCT, which is in itself an imitation of the real question. Does the population or does the model, or does reality have this property? This is a research question. Thank I, do, I yeah. simply do not see the point. Perhaps I, sh I should be more involved with the community to understand what gain they have from this double imitation. Yeah, I, I like the framing of that. And uh, maybe we have some work to do together in order to, to do that. And just to keep it short, uh, as decision scientists, we usually think in parallel universes and counterfactuals. Uh, and an RCT is only mimicking that, as you said, but, uh, but it helped me a lot to communicate with physicians, but maybe we, we need to look at that in the training setting. So thank you. Another question goes to, um, um, so we have seen machine learning as a prediction tool, but less used as a causal tool. So what do you think could the machine learning 
does that have a role in causal inference in the future and where? It already has. <clears throat> Look at the exercise of transportability. Okay. I have to combine results taken from various studies. Okay. What do I get as a result of my analytical exercise? I get a formula called a transport transporting formula, which is a huge combination of expressions. Some of them have a statistical character, namely they just use a Bayesian conditionization with just conditional expectations. Some of them have a do expression, which means you need to get the data from experimental studies. And it gives you a recipe of how to combine them. Well, every time you find there an expression which relies on the Bayesian conditionalization, right? This is an exercise for machine learning because that's something that neural nets can do very nicely to compute conditional expectations. The probability of an outcome given that you see the training set X. Okay? So the division of labor between causal an analysis and machine learning is already given you in the algebra. In the, form, in the formula that comes out of it. Thank you. There are more questions, and uh, but in the sake of time, um, I just want to mention it to you and all the attendees. So there were a lot of questions about inference, p-values, and what you know, what do you need? Uh, uh, how do you estimate sample size for putting up your causal model and so on? I'm going to skip those, uh, and there is uh, a, another bundle of questions which looks more like into the future. So let me let me summarize it like that, and that that's the last question. What's next? What's, what's on the horizon of, of uh, causal inference? When are we done? So is there a next level on your ladder of wisdom? Uh, how would a future artificial intelligence uh, generate its own DAG and, and use that for real individual um, yeah, personalized medicine? <laughs> and, and if you think 100 years ahead, do, do you have a vision? Yes. I, I can think about two areas that we'll see a tremendous advance. One is automated scientists. Let, let's just say automated trialists. Okay. In this context, uh, automated experimenter. It's an um, agent, computer program, that can decide on the next experiment to conduct, the next observation to buy, the next uh, variable to observe, the next um, uh, counterfactual to imagine and generate explanation. We'll be able to communicate with other agents on the basis of what they've learned. That is what I mean, and, and direct attention and manage curiosity probably, properly, like we scientists do, okay? That will happen in the next five to 10 years because we have now something that we never had before. And this is a computer model of a state of mind that we call deep understanding. Thank, it's thank a, you. It's a system that can answer questions on all three levels of the ladder. The first time that we have a model, a mechanical system, or a model, a computer model of a state of mind that can do that. And it's a gold mine because once you do that, you can answer questions not only about you and the environment, you can also answer questions about you and another agent. If you have the model of your friends, your wife, your child, 
your parents as part of the environment, then you should be able to develop social intelligence, namely to communicate with, with among, to have a communication among these agents, which involves social relationship, such as responsibility, such as trust, such as empathy. And these are very important to build up trust with a computer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I like these last comments connecting curiosity to, to the machinery. And uh, uh, thank you so much, Judea. Uh, there are more questions and we could go on forever. But uh, uh, in the sake of time, uh, I want to thank you so much for your talk and the follow-up conversation, which range from history, current issues, and, and also the future. Uh, I definitely learned something myself, which I will use in my teaching at, at my university or, uh, or in the uh, ISPO courses we give also on causal inference and other disciplines. Uh, and also thanks a lot to you all, dear audience, for your participation. I hope this event not only provided causal principles or answers to some of your questions, but also made you interested and hungry for more. At ISPO, we talk about real world evidence, the use of registry, secondary data, the combination of experiments and observational data was addressed today by Judea Pearl. Uh, and we do this work to inform health policy decision makers, providers, patients, payers, many stakeholders, and we will only succeed if we have a solid knowledge of causal inference in order to achieve, you know, first a proper analysis, but second also, which variables should we collect in the, in the state of planning a new study? Uh, otherwise we will always derive invalid non-causal conclusions and HDA agencies will continue to have limited trust in real world observational evidence. So, so personally, I hope to see more DAX in the method section of our conference presentations, posters and papers and if you, dear audience, you want to go on, the book of why is an excellent source to dive deeper. Some people ask about recommendations. Uh, so this is when you can definitely continue the journey. Uh, and I also want to thank at this point uh, ISPO for the professional and hard work preparing this event. And with that, I'm handing back to Julia. Yes, thank you so much to our speakers. Thank you, Uwe, thank you, Judea, and to all of our attendees for joining and submitting your questions. The recording will be sent out to all registrants uh, by email by the end of the day, and it will be available for viewing until February 28th. I also would like to ask you to complete the evaluation of the Signal episode. The survey link uh, is in your chat feature at the bottom of the screen. And uh, we really appreciate your input because that will help us to improve the selection and delivery of healthcare issues and topics for the uh, future signals. And talking about the future signals, the next signal episode is scheduled for May 16, 2022, and will provide an opportunity to interact with speakers both virtually and also in person because the signal series go live as part of the eSport 2022 annual conference in May. So the topic, the speakers will be announced early February and registration will open thereafter. Keep an eye on ESPOR announcement and visit the ESPOR Signal Series webpage. Once again, thank you, Judea. Thank you, Uwe. Thank you to our participants. Thank you for participants. having me. Absolutely. And yeah. we see you at the next Signal episode, everybody. Bye-bye.